Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Rosanna and I'm here with an amazing modern day Renaissance man, Simon Reed, author of number one Amazon bestseller, The Tao of Trading, How to Build Abundant Wealth in Any Market Condition. Over 30 years of experience as a trader and investor, Citibank banker, advisor, senior positions at Goldman Sachs, options trader, Jeet Kune Do instructor, Reiki master, and teacher. Holistic approach to trading and investing. You have an amazing background, Simon. Is there anything you don't do? <laughs> How are you today? <laughs> I'm really well, Roseanne. How are you? Thanks for having me. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, what? I would like to just dive right into the market. I think everyone yeah, wants sure. to know your thoughts on what is going on with this market lately. It's going up. <laughs> yes, you're, you're why? Were something a bit more. <laughs> you We're all happy about that. that, didn't you? Yeah. Is this uh, a not technically not driven? Is it technically uh, driven? Um, uh, I mean, look, the rates um, are going up. What are your thoughts? The market. I mean, the market is behaving like we re-entering the era of free money all right and that's not it's kind of ignoring the fact that the fed funds rates gone from zero to 4.75 percent but you look at the market's reaction to powell's press conference yesterday we had uh, fomc yesterday and it, it really gave me uh 2021 vibes you know that everything the the, the, the crappier the, the symbol the, the the more it rallied you know, we, we're looking at rallies in things like uh, Carvana and ARKK and crypto and the crappier the coin, the more it rallies. You know, we've got Solana blitzing Bitcoin and, and uh, you know, the risk appetite is alive and well. And it, it really just reminds me of 2021 again. Um, now, that's not to say that, uh, you know, the, the bigger stocks and the, the high quality stocks can't play catch up if, if there is a you know, kind of a, a performance chase on, which which is definitely possible. Um, and if we look at the S and P, the S and P is up what's uh, about seven and a half percent year to date. Uh, so basically, the month of January and the first day of February. Um, but half of that performance is your Fang stocks and Nvidia and Tesla. So again, a lot a lot of concentration in all of those stocks that were real kind of market darlings, you know, the, the growth darlings in in twenty twenty one. You think this could be a big short squeezing rally? Um, well, well, it is. I mean, yeah, it's short covering is how these things always begin. And when you see things like ARKK post, I think it's had its second best month ever in, in the month of January. You know, there's a lot of short covering going on. Tesla was up, what, 40% in January. Um, mm -hmm. and, and short covering is how is how it always begins, right? Because shorts want to lock in profit and then the short covering causes some upward price movement, which other people start taking notice of. And then the market starts moving and, and everybody else kind of gets dragged kicking and screaming back in because if they don't and the market keeps rallying, uh, there's, there's career risk involved. Yes, absolutely. There's a lot of peer pressure going on to jump yeah. into this rally. Uh, why isn't my portfolio involved with this rally that's going <laughs> on? Um, I noticed on your wonderful YouTube channel, um, you had some technical analysis, you have some great charts that you reviewed, it seems like all the indexes, the spot, the SPX and QQQ shot right through the 200 day moving average. Would you say looking at the technicals, we are out of this bear market or is just an, uh, this possibly another bear market rally? Uh, look, I mean, I, I don't know that it's all that helpful thinking about this in terms of a bull market or a bear market because if you if you assume that we're in a bear market it's going to give you a a bias all right if you if you keep telling yourself we're in a bear market we're in a bear market you're going to find it that much harder to pull the trigger on long trades and and you're potentially going to burn yourself shorting things too quickly and too early so you know as a trader I'm neither bullish nor bearish, really. I'm I'm just looking at what opportunities are presented to me with the setups that I use that give me a probabilistic edge. Uh, do I think the market could rally further? Yeah, I, I do. I, I don't think we're going to make new all-time highs this year. That, that, that would really surprise me. 
Um, but yeah, if the S and P gets up to forty three hundred, uh, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Wow. Oh. Very interesting. Yes, I agree with you. We need to be flexible, follow price, and not fall into these confirmation biases. Uh, the biases can absolutely affect our decision making. And trading is about making uh, good, accurate decisions um, under in critical situations. So, speaking of trading, you are an options trader, and I know you're That's located right. in Singapore a vast different time zone than New York. Uh, is it safe to say you don't day trade? <laughs> yeah, you bet. Um, no, if I was day trading, I'd be up all night. No, I, I swing trade. So all, all of my positions, you know, I hold for a minimum of minimum of a couple of days generally and, and often for, you know, two or three, two or three, four weeks would, would be a, a reasonable holding period. Uh, and yeah, I, I just make all of my decisions. Well, I make 95% of my decisions based off the daily chart. I do look at other time frames to to get confirmation, but in terms of the, the chart that I anchor my trades to, it's it's nearly always the daily chart. I see. Great, thank you. And so these days, with your options trading, are you playing it more to the upside? I've noticed there's a lot of put buying lately. I think everyone's trying to play the bounce. They they're thinking it's going to go down. Um, yeah, that wasn't you? me. <laughs> that wasn't you. I think the short trade is very overcrowded. Have you noticed that? Well, yeah, it's probably going to get a lot less crowded. A lot of those recent put buyers will be getting thinned out, I would think. Uh, I, I mean, I made the comment a week or so ago. That we we had that uh, we had that big fall, and the, the market sort of apparently failed at the two hundred day moving average just just for a day or so, uh, and we had a big pullback. We saw a surge in put buying. And I made the comment that um, all of these freshly minted puts will, will just add fuel to a short covering rally if, if the market continues to move upwards. And, and that's exactly what happened. Interesting. Thank you. So let's move on a little bit to the fundamentals of the indices. And we need to talk about the equity risk premium. And with the risk free rate over 4% at this point, um, and the Fed raising rates and they're continuing that um are you noticing that you know maybe spx is getting very expensive and based on this higher risk-free rate do you anticipate that these valuations and price should be coming down do you think of that in the back of your mind uh, look i i agree with you I, I think the equity risk premium is getting really, really skinny. Um, I, I would agree with you that the S&P 500 is looking fully valued, if not outright expensive. Um, but valuation is rarely a driver of stock market performance. Um, my old shop, Goldman Sachs, produced a piece of research in December 2017, and they found that the, the R squared, the, the correlation coefficient of valuation and 12-month stock price performance was 0.09. What that means is 91% of a stock price's performance on a period of 12 months or less can be explained by things other than valuation. So as a technical trader, it, it doesn't really inform any of my decisions. Very interesting. Thank but, you but, for but that. I, I, but I agree with your observations. Yeah, I, I think um, people who are buying the market here for the long term, you know, they may end up having to hold it for a very, very long term because I, I don't think that things are looking cheap. And and if we do enter a recession later this year or early next year, uh, now could be a, actually a fairly expensive entry point. Exactly. Thank you. Um, speaking of recession, potential recession, what are your thoughts? Let's move over to the macro and the backdrop of the market and the global economy. Do you foresee or thinking maybe we could have a recession later this year into next year or possibly stagflation? Yeah, look, I, I think a recession is is probably a, a greater than 50-50 chance, but I think it won't. It, the, the market would love a recession now because then the market will get its much awaited uh, dovish pivot. Um, although I think I think the market's kind of changing its tune a little bit. We can, we can talk about that in a minute. I think if you know if we get a recession, and, and I think that is more likely than not, it'll be late this year. You know, probably third quarter at the earliest, more likely fourth quarter, uh, and that's really because the unemployment situation remains pretty pretty strong, pretty resilient, and 
it's I, I think a, a classic recession is going to take a lot longer to unfold than, the, than, the, than what the bears would like. And people looking for that are probably just going to have to be fairly patient. Exactly. We have an inverted yield curve with the 10 year, the three month, the two year. They're all very inverted. And I always read that it could be nine to 28 months away. It's not necessarily going to be occurring next month, like many people assume. Um, yeah. I guess my question um, that I think of right away is, you know, looking at history, you know, can we actually have the market continue to be, in my opinion, irrational and, and going up amidst all these continued rate hikes? The market is taking the view, or this is my opinion, uh, the market is taking the view that the economy is going to slow down, but it's not going to be, it's not going to slow down enough to cause a nasty recession and, and a collapse in earnings, but it will slow down enough that the Fed will stop hiking and, and maybe even start easing. Uh, you look at the bond market, you know, the bond market's predicting what, I don't know, six rate cuts, but by the end of 2024. So, um, that's that's the market seems to be in this kind of Goldilocks sort of period at the moment where, yeah, the economy is going to cool down, but it's not going to get torpedoed. Uh, and that will cause the Fed to stop hiking and, and maybe even pivot. Mm, interesting perspective that the market has <laughs> the Goldilocks yeah. period. Um, yes, I think um, we should definitely um, follow price, remain flexible, but always bear that in mind that things can change rather mm. quickly if the market realizes that um, inflation could possibly not come down to the two to two and a half percent that um, it's possibly assuming. Now, let's go to global inflation. It seems to be a global challenge. It's not just here in the U.S., um, what are your thoughts on this persistently elevated inflation? Do you think it will remain sticky for much longer than the market may believe? Look, I, you know, the, the the initial impulses that kind of caused the, the initial inflation spike early last year, they've all gone away. All right. So we're talking about things like the, the surging commodity prices and, you know, the the sanctions and obviously the, the war in Ukraine and the busted supply chains and the demand surge from reopening, all, all of that has kind of muddled its way through. Uh, what was, I guess, becoming more concerning was wage growth. And, and we saw well, so about six months ago, wages were growing at like six and a half percent per annum. And, and it really looked like we were getting into a, a wage price spiral. That's looking less problematic now. Um, we, we saw the, the the employment cost index came in cooler than expected on Wednesday, and, and obviously the establishment survey, the jobs figure uh, last month was uh, lower than expected as well. Um, well. We'll know more tomorrow when when the uh, jobs figure comes out again on Friday. But it looks like wage pressure is moderating. Um, it's still there. I mean, four and a half percent wage growth is in no way consistent with two percent inflation. Uh, but it's a lot better than 7% wage growth. Uh, we've got things like uh, deglobalization. This is this is not going to cause an inflation shock, but it's one of those things that I, th I think stops inflation from getting back down to 2% and probably keeps it you know, may maybe at a floor of, say, 4%. Uh, we've got China reopening as well. Um, a lot of people have got this view that uh, China reopening is going to be deflationary because uh, China is just going to go back to normal like that. And they're just going to start cranking out iPhone 14s all over again. Um, but what we've known from every other major economy that's reopened after a long period of lockdown is there is a demand surge and an inflation shock. And if China is like any other major economy, it, it looks like there's a, there'll be an inflation shock coming there as well. And the other thing that we've learned is that uh, it, things have not gone back to normal. You know, we, we've not gone back to 2019. Things look and feel very different in the workforce and the marketplace. Uh, and I think assumptions that China is just going to go back to 2019 as well are, are probably misplaced. Thank you for that. Speaking of China, um, I'm of the opinion that it could definitely add to the inflationary pressures as well as the commodities pricing. Um, now, let's talk before we get into China um, and other global issues and, and the asset classes of commodities. 
I want to ask your opinion regarding the um, anchoring of rates. It, historically, rates in this range aren't really that high. What are your thoughts uh, with your experience regarding rates and where we're at right now? I mean, you're right. If, if you look at a Fed funds rate of 5%, it's it's not that high compared to history. But um, US government debt levels are astronomical compared to history. And I think that's what makes it different this time in, in relation to uh, where rates are. We, we, we can't revisit a world of 17% bond yields because uh, it would be incredibly difficult to for the US Treasury to service the debt. Um, you know, debt to GDP has, has doubled since uh, the last time we were in an inflationary cycle. Yes, absolutely. Do you, in your opinion, anticipate that we may get um, some a pause soon and possibly a cut later this year? Are you in that mindset? No, I mean a, a pause. Yes, I mean we, we you know, we, we've got um, and the market's pricing a, an eighty percent chance of a twenty-five basis point hike in March, and then we probably get another one in May, and and quite possibly we, we're done at that point, or, or we do get a pause. I think it would be very unlikely that we get a cut and unless the US economy for some reason just falls into a hole. Uh, as, as you stated earlier, it's it's likely that we're going to get some inflationary pressures from China. Uh, we've still got wage growth well ahead of sort of a, a 2% sort of target. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't think the Fed would start cutting this year. Agree. Now we saw, talk about China reopening and you know they're a huge contributor to the global GDP. I think they're the second largest. Um, and with that adding inflationary, possibly adding inflationary pressures, do you think that globally we should experience even continued slower growth and as well as in the United States? I think so. I mean, China is really the only major economy globally that's expected to see accelerating growth in 2023. I think all of the other major economies, their, their growth is going to decelerate, uh, if, if not go negative as, as we get towards the end of the year. Yes, thank you. Are you looking at possibly investing in any of the emerging countries globally um, when you do your trading no. or investing? I mean, I, look, I, I'm... I'm a technical trader, so I, I don't really care about investment themes or what have you. I, I, if, if I was taking an investment view, I'd, I'd be cautious on things like China right now because every person from every bank I speak to says we're, we're overweight China. You know, we're, we're long China. We're long emerging markets. It is just such a consensus trade. Um, you look at the uh, Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey, I think uh, – you know, bullish, bullish China tilts are at a 16-year high. You look at uh, data from Goldman Sachs Prime Broking, you know, they've been buying Chinese stocks like they're going out of fashion. And, uh, you know, these these massively consensus trades just have a way of uh, not quite working out the way everybody would hope. Thank you. Valid point. Um, I um, That makes a lot of sense. Now, labor market, you touched upon that. And, you know, services are sticky and services are a function of the strong labor market and employment. Do you foresee any potential issues arising in that area? Or do you think that we will have a continued tight labor market? What are your thoughts on that and its contribution to what's going on with inflation? So if, if this soft landing narrative really kind of becomes consensus, it, it, in a sense, it could help prolong the strength in the labor market because if, if everybody believes we're going to have a soft landing, companies will be, I think, less inclined to cut staff, sack people in anticipation of you know what, what might have been thought of as a nasty recession. Um, consumers are still, you know, they've still got some firepower. They've still got um, credit card debt. Uh, people who are changing jobs, you know, I think what was the average wage increase? It was somewhere around 8% last year, mm -hmm. I think. Um, so, yeah, the consumer, I wouldn't say the consumer is in amazing shape, but uh, they've still got fuel in the tank to to keep keep spending, uh, keep services alive, uh, which will all contribute to to employment and I think continue tight, the tight labor market. 
Yes, absolutely. I could see the wage growth con contributing to the nominal spending and which it further fuels the nominal demand at, and sort of like the wage price spiral. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting phenomenon in itself. Um, well, let's people think on. in nominal terms. Mm -hmm, exactly. We live in a nominal yeah. world. Yeah. Um, absolutely. All our data is in nominal terms. Let's move on to the bond market. And what is the bond market telling us regarding the yields that we're seeing? Well, I mean, the bond market is, it's kind of looking at uh, a situation where the Fed has to cut rates fairly rapidly as, as we get to 2024. Um, so the bond market is probably slightly more bearish than the equity market, I would think. Um, certainly the, the, the bond market doesn't appear to be sending any massively uh, inflationary signals, uh, more the opposite, more, more concerned about uh, def deflation or, or recession. Interesting. And the dollar, I know you charted the dollar DXY. Uh, what are your thoughts on what you're seeing there? Do you expect potentially uh, it to go back up um, or do you think? Further yeah, I mean, the, the, the trend is down um, and it's, it, I mean, it, it looks to me like it's just taken out a support level yesterday. Um, I, I never, I always like to wait a couple of days for confirmation when, when a level gets taken out. But if, if we, if we are, if, if, if the trend continues to decelerate, uh, sorry, if the, tr if the downward trend continues to accelerate, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, my target on DXY is, is sort of around 98, 97.8. Uh, and if we get there, uh, that's that's a that's certainly a, a tailwind for the S and P five hundred and other risky assets. Absolutely interesting. Um, so let's just sum up. Uh, you had a great tweet um, that said there's a bull case with the Fed pausing. There's a bear case with a recession, recession and earnings slump, or the contrarian view, as you called it. Inflation and economy will reaccelerate this year with upward pressure on rates and volatility. Are you in any of those camps? You know what? I, I'm not really because I, I I just, I try and avoid narratives at all costs because as soon as you subscribe to a narrative, it, it restricts your mental flexibility. Uh, if you try and just look, what I try to do, Rosanna, is just trade the chart in front of me. I love uh, it. Rather, th rather than try and backfit charts to some story that's playing out in my head. Uh, I've just found that trading setups that give me a probabilistic edge, it, it just works. It, not every trade is a winner, uh, but I win more than I lose. And my winners tend to be bigger than my losers. And you know, if, if you can do that consistently, uh, there's good money to be made. I love that. Words of wisdom. You are an extremely experienced trader. And um, so we really value that. Everyone, please listen to that. Don't have these biases and your, use any heuristics, availability heuristics or anything. Just go with a clear, open mind and just trade the chart, follow price. I think someone, I think someone said that, I don't know who said that, but follow price uh, ultimately. Yeah. Um, now, before we move on to your amazing book, where we will talk about this great mindset that you utilize, um, I want to just know your thoughts on what you're seeing with the VIX. Is it a meaningful for us for volatility? What are you seeing uh, over there? Yeah, I mean, I, I I still find the VIX useful to look at. I mean, I know everyone on Twitter these days tells me that the VIX is broken because of zero days to expiration options trading. I don't know. The, the VIX to me seems to be working more or less um one one anomaly is if you look at the vix over the last year every, every time it's got below 20 it's been a very good uh, selling opportunity on the s&p uh, this time was different uh and the vix has sort of broken well below 20 now it's trading back in the teens but if you go back over the last decade plus uh, the vix spent most of its time in the teens or sort of between 12 and 20 and historically, uh, a, a VIX of 20 is a, is a market with a little, little hint of fear about it. Uh, and if you look at the last couple of years, the VIX has barely been below 20. But it, it looks like the VIX may be kind of entering a new trading regime where, once again, 20 is a, is a slightly scared market and, and maybe, maybe a low VIX becomes in, in, in the low teens. It's too early to say, uh, but if, if we see it, what I'm looking for is if the VIX trades below 20, for say three months with only the occasional spike above 20, that to me would, would signal a, a regime change or, or a, 
I guess, a resumption of the, of the prior regime prior to 2020. Interesting. Thank you so much. Now, with the VIX, and usually means we have IV is lower, um, this would be a better market to be buying options rather than selling. Um, so does that affect, are you using debit spreads more so these days? I know you do trade in spreads, peanut butter options in your great book, <laughs> yeah. Tower of Trading. You are yeah. a spread trader. Are you doing more debit spreads rather than credit spreads these days? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been doing a mix. Um, the way I think about it, I, I will usually do a debit spread or just a, a naked long option position mm -hmm. if I'm doing a, a directional trade in the, in the direction of the trend. Uh, I will often use credit spreads if I'm doing a counter trend trade because they're just a little more forgiving. And you are a butterfly trader as well, correct? Uh, yeah, I, I do butterflies as well. Like if, if I've got a fairly specific price target within a specific frame of mind, uh, butterflies can be great because you can put them on generally fairly cheaply uh, without any theta exposure. They're, they're, they're sort of resistant to that uh, time value of money degradation. And you can get a, a really attractive risk reward with them as well. Wonderful. Now for our audience, could you just give us a basic idea of a butterfly trade on a stock? Do you trade ETFs or do you do mainly stocks when you do? I, I do. I do all of the above. Wonderful. Yeah. Could you give us just a basic trade on a butterfly? Let's say right now, like something you would do. Well, there's, honestly, there's there's nothing that I would do right now. Um, I I did have a butterfly on SPY, which okay. I closed out before the Fed. And what I did, I I I bought 400 strike calls. I'd sold two lots of the 405 strike, and then I'd bought the 410 strike uh, ah. for protection. That was a five dollar wide butterfly. It was okay. uh, it was just a, a one week tenor, but you know I, I the, so the the strike was five dollars wide. No, you know, the, the butterfly was $5 wide. I'd paid about 70 cents for it. So it was a pretty attractive risk reward. You're paying 70 cents for something that could, could potentially be worth $5. Well, I think I paid 67 cents for it, actually. Um, I sold out of that pre-Fed uh, and I didn't make much on it. I sold it for 78 cents. So, you know, I made about 18%. It was it was a pretty, pretty small gain. Um, but I just thought that was, it was worth Worth the punt that SPY could uh, trade up to 405 ahead of Fed. Uh, it, it it got there, but um, you know there was still some event risk, implied volatility in the the options that I struck it in, and the options expiring third of May, and so the the body of the butterfly just didn't decay away very much. So it ended up being a very small gain, but okay. you know small gains better than a loss. Absolutely, green is green, and that's a positive. Yeah. Um, it, profit is profit. So thank you so much for sharing that. And time period wise, do you usually go a few months out when you do no. your options trading or? Oh, sorry for options trading. Look, my, my typical holding period would be anywhere from two or three days to two or three weeks. And and I'll have to say my, my holding period has, has shortened really since the start of last year, just with increasing volatility in the markets. Um, so I, I'm usually buying options with an expiration anywhere from sort of four to eight weeks out. Okay. Very nice. Uh, that, that would be typical. If I'm doing a butterfly, though, um, because the you, you really don't make money on the butterfly until it gets pretty close to expiration. Uh, I'll typically do them one to two weeks out, maybe three weeks, but they, they tend to be much shorter time frame. And being shorter in time frame doesn't matter on a butterfly because they're, they're generally theta neutral. Sometimes they're even theta positive. So you can actually benefit from the passage of time on, on the valuation of the structure. Thank you so much. That makes sense. And appreciate you explaining and giving us that example. You know, Simon, you so eloquently combine Western and Eastern philosophies to empower people with a positive trading mindset so they can maximize their profits while minimizing their risks. Of course, you know what I'm talking about. The Tao of Trading. Excellent wow. book. And I love the color Thank red. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great color of luck. Um, so I love that book. Could you please tell us um, about mindset? You talk about that in your book, and we all know that mindset is about 70, 80% of the trade. Um, what kind of mindset do you embody to have that winning trader's mindset? 
So I guess there, there are several aspects to this. I, I think the first one we've already touched on, and it's about just having that mental flexibility and uh, not getting wedded to a belief and, and, and being aware of the reality of the market. And uh, one of the ways this, this manifests is people, I mean, people in general would, would rather drink bleach than admit they're wrong, right? <laughs> and so somebody will, will buy puts on the S&P 500 and, and it'll rally and, and they'll say, well, I'm right. The market's wrong. The market's stupid. The market's insane. The market's this, the market's that. Meanwhile, they're, they're bleeding money on their puts, convinced that they're right. Well, you know, if, if the market's moving against you, you're not right. You, you, you're, you're literally wrong. Um, and so it's, to be a good trader, you've got to be able to recognize when you're wrong and admit it to yourself and do something about it quickly, all right? Because the longer you leave a position that's moving against you, the, the bigger your loss is going to be. Um, now, in trading, you're going to be wrong often. With trading, we're always dealing with probabilities, not certainties. So you've always got to have a probabilistic mindset. Now, we, we grow up in school, we learn things like, you know, Newtonian physics, if A happens, B will happen. Uh, trading's not like that. Trading is a case of if, if, if A happens, according to my setup, B is more likely to happen, but anything can happen. And always planning for that anything can happen eventuality. And that's where risk control is, is so important. But if you're able to admit that you're wrong on a position quickly, it means you can get out of losing positions quickly when they're still small losses and not waiting for them to become big losses. Now, a good win rate in trading, you know, if, if you can win 60% of your trades, that, that's a really good win rate, particularly if you can manage your risk such that your winners are, say, twice the size of your losers. You can make really good money doing that. Now, this is an important way in which trading is very different from real life. If, if you go through real life, you go through your job and you're only right 60% of the time, you're probably going to look like a Muppet and, and your boss is probably going to sack you, right? Um, and so people kind of really struggle to, to adapt to that way of life in trading, of, of accepting that yeah, I'm going to be wrong 35, 40, 45% of the time. But so long as I admit it quickly and cut my losses soon before they be become big losses, I can still make really good money. I love that. Thank you. It's about being accountable, accepting that you make mistakes. And I think the ratio is that, you know, it's about 50-50, you know, uh, even with great traders, you're not always right, but it's cutting those losses quickly when the trade goes against you. Um, and yeah. I um, studied and I focus in behavioral economics and decision-making. And we always talk about you know, uh, trading is about decisions. I mean, at the core, it's about improving your judgment's accuracy um, to make decisions that have a greater expected value. And of course, we're human. So we have biases and heuristics. And, you know, we need to minimize the mother of all biases, which is overconfidence. And mm -hmm. so we tend to have too much confidence sometimes. And we need to accept that we do make mistakes. So that leads me to the next part of this question, which you talk about extensively in your book, risk management. And last time we met, you brought up a fantastic point. Reduced position sizing is a mm -hmm. great way to minimize risk and reduce emotion. Um, yeah. Could you please talk about that as well as your overall risk management thinking, please? Sure. So the important thing to realize, if, if you're not a trader, uh, you may not realize this yet, but you nobody gets smarter once they're in a trade. All right. When, when, once you put a position on and you're in a trade, emotions can start to stir. All right. And when the emotional brain is in control, your ability to make high quality decisions is compromised. All right. The, the, the executive brain kind of steps aside and the, you know, the emotional brain, the lizard brain kind of takes over uh, and it's not as good at making decisions. So anything you can do to keep the emotions very low level uh, will help the executive brain to, to run the show. And I always say if, if my emotions stray beyond 
mild contentment to mild disappointment, I'm trading too big. And I need to either reduce my position size or reduce the number of positions that I have on, but I've got to get less risk. You know, I've, I've got less, less risk exposure. I've got to get, take risk off my book. Um, because if you're, if you're feeling exhilarated or, or you're feeling despair with, with every swing of the market, you're going to make really, really poor quality decisions. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I think you would agree then that establishing a trading plan before you execute the trade and trying to follow through and maintain that, because as you yeah. said, once you're in that trade, your emotions take over and then you start to think, oh, I'll just hold this a little longer. Oh, it's this and that. And then you can see your green go to red. And that's something we don't want to occur. Indeed. Um, but yeah, you, you become, you, you certainly become even stupider once you're in a trade. It happens to everyone. <laughs> you, know, you become more and more emotional. You get used to it with time, but, it, but as a new trader, yeah, it can be very exciting and, and very scary, you know, from, from one minute to the next. Uh, having a trading plan is, um, for, for anyone in, in my program, it's it's not negotiable. You you have to do it. You have to write one. Um, it's one of those things that people think, ah, I don't need a trading plan. I I. I remember everything. I remember all my rules. And, and the number of times I get people ask me, Simon, I'm in XYZ stock. It's moved against me. What should I do? And my first response is always, well, what does your trading plan tell you you should do? And that's when they go, oh. <laughs> so if you've got a trading plan and you print it out and you put it on your desk, you put it on your desk where you do your trading and it's visible and it's easily accessible, you never have to feel scared or confused because your trading plan will always tell you what you should do. Exactly. Thank uh, you. And it's, it's, it's so important, uh, particularly as, as a new trader, but I, I still write a, a new trading plan every year. I just finished it uh, a couple of weeks ago. Very nice. A new trading plan updated yearly. I love that. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I tweak it, you know, mm -hmm. obviously I've got one that, that works for me, but uh, you know, I, I, I make changes and yeah, you know, I, hold myself accountable. But a trading plan is, is an ironclad agreement between you and yourself. And you just, you, you, if, if you can't be, if you can't be brutally honest with yourself, you're really going to struggle in this game. Absolutely. It's about self-awareness, knowing yourself and having um, awareness of what your strengths and weaknesses are. And, and when you do make those mistakes to so try to minimize them, I mean, we're human, we all make mistakes. Um, and then, you know, at, at that point, uh, following your commitment to yourself, your agreement, like you said, an agreement you have with yourself. Um, so could you just give us some ideas of what we could, um, so we could devise our own trading plans? I'm sure you have a fantastic one. Any yeah, ideas I mean, you could share with us? Certainly. I mean, get, the first thing you want to do is, is get really clear on your, your own personal why. why. Why are you doing this? Why are you trading in the first place? And and if your answer is to, to make money, uh, sorry, that's that's the wrong answer. Uh, money is is never the, the reason. There's always something much much deeper than that. Um, do you do you know the parable of the quarter inch drill bit? I think so. Please share with us. So, I, I think I think I got this from Seth Godin. I, I certainly didn't make it up, but but I, I love I love it, and it's very applicable. Um, and I'm going to be deliberately sexist in this because I'm a man and it, it's more it's relatable. Okay. <laughs> uh, but why, why, why does the man go into a hardware store and buy some quarter inch drill bits? Why? Well, because, because he wants some quarter inch drill bits, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's the superficial answer, but you know, and it's like saying, why are you trading? Oh, cause I want more money. That's, that's the superficial answer, but, but no, nobody wants quarter inch drill bits, right? They, they, they want to do something with those quarter inch drill bits. Oh, okay. So the man buys quarter inch drill bits because he wants quarter inch holes in his wall. Well, maybe that makes a bit more sense, right? But come on, who, who wants holes in their wall? It looks unsightly. It's pointless. Why, why would anybody want holes in their wall? Ah, oh, well, okay. He wants holes in his wall so that he can put some screws in to mount a shelf. Oh, so he's buying the quarter inch drill bits so that he can mount a shelf on his wall. It's getting warmer. The real reason he's buying the quarter inch drill bits is because he wants the feeling he gets when his wife says to him, 
Oh, thank you for finally putting that shelf up. You've done a great job. It looks amazing. And your study looks awesome. All right. And, and you, that's what I mean by digging deeper into your own personal why. So, so get really clear on what it is you want to achieve from trading. And, and money is only scratching the surface. There's always a, an emotional driver there. And if you can get clear on what that emotional driver is, you can stick at this through thick and thin, through the hard times. There will be hard times. Uh, but that is what will give you direction and, and is, it'll, is what will give you the consistency and the staying power to keep at it. I love that. See, once again, Simon, you are so much more than just the tangibles. You're intangible. And, and that's exactly <laughs> how I see in your book. You, in, you um, incorporate the Western and Eastern philosophies. You are Reiki master and Jeet Kune Do. Uh, sorry if I don't pronounce that properly. No, but that's, you that's combine... Good these other spiritual and um, just other elements with your trading. And I like to meditate in the morning before I begin my day. I think it's important to center ourselves and to clear our mind and to search deep, as you just said, that it, it's not just about the money. Yes, you know, when you do that butterfly trade as you did on SPY, you made some money but there's a deeper reason as to why you are making those trades. And I always talk about, you know, building wealth and ultimately wealth is about freedom. And it's about having time to spend with our loved ones or giving our children, if we have children, a better future, yeah. uh, paying for their college or giving them just a, a great life. So there's so much more than just a few dollars. And I'm not, I mean, for me, I'm not in it just to count the, the little uh, dollars and the digital, now it's all digital the, to see a little number changing up. Uh, <laughs> it's so much deeper and so much more. And I love that example that you give. Um, it's not just about the drill bit. It's about that feeling he evokes with his wife. Um, yeah. Thank you so you, much you get for it. that. You, you, you've got it, yeah. Absolutely. And so I hope we can inspire others uh, that search for your why as to why you're doing all this. And it's that real deep down self-reflection is so important. Um, thank you for that. Uh, definitely check out the Tao of Trading book. Uh, it's a non-traditional book on trading. And um, thank you uh, for all you do, Simon. Now, I want to touch upon asset classes. And, you know, I, I had written about this saying that 2023 may be an alternative asset class year. Um, and, you know, you are you were at Goldman Sachs and Citibank as a banker. You're vastly familiar with bonds and fixed income assets. How are you looking at all of those different asset classes? Are you trading or looking to invest in any of those or commodities, uh, gold? I know gold's been on a tear lately. Are you an investor? Are you bullish on any of those? Or what are your thoughts? No, I would say not particularly. Um, I mean, you look at, I mean, copper's had a useful run up. Well, oil has sort of done nothing. Um, I, I'm not going to kind of get dragged into narratives because they, they just frankly i mean it's not something that i use um in terms of things like gold 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 can be a tough one to trade i i prefer to accumulate the physical and uh you know i, I certainly stepped up my accumulation of physical gold um through the, the last quarter of last year um yeah it's been in a, a beautiful uptrend it's, it's it's moved up really really nicely but uh it, it's barely had a pullback you know it hasn't hasn't been an easy one to play from a from a trading perspective so really and truly uh yeah i've got i've got some some coins and some bullion and i'm happy with that uh in terms of bonds i mean obviously bonds and stocks have had a, a very strong correlation uh that won't be the way forever that correlation will break down one day uh, but but until it does, uh, I, I would assume that the status quo will will remain until we get evidence to the contrary. Um, in terms of other asset classes, I think uh, sort of private investments, uh, VC, private equity, uh, unlisted property, private property investments could all be due for some uh, some some hefty right right towns this year. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that um, that's an asset class that excites me particularly either. Just just at the moment. Yes, I see. Are you possibly looking at any, you know, opportunities in the real estate market, let's say? I mean, we us 
we tend to think a little differently, a little deeper. And I look at challenges as opportunities. And, you know, we always have a very positive, and I love, like you said in your book, winning mindset. And so when I see these downturns, I look at opportunities. Are you looking for any opportunities in any of those asset classes for the long term? Not really, because I'm I'm not, I'm just not a long-term investor. I, I You know, I used to be, but, you know, I, as I've spent more and more time trading, more and more in my of my investment portfolio became my trading portfolio when I, when I saw what was possible from it. Uh, you know, making ten percent per annum in an investment portfolio, yeah, I mean it's it's better than a slap in the face, but compared to what you can make trading, it's it's kind of quite pedestrian. And uh, I've ended up in a situation now where, yeah, I, I own some some sort of physical precious metals. I've got a a, a tiny holding in, in sort of Bitcoin and Ethereum that, that was more just so I, I I knew kind of how the market worked and knew what cold storage was and what have you. Um, yeah, I, I own some some real estate, but uh, other than that, um, I, I wouldn't call myself a long-term investor in any of the other traditional asset classes. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and now we know the real reason you're holding gold is for the feeling that your wife gets when she sees all the gold, <laughs> correct? <laughs> it's not okay, just for the physical asset. <laughs> I just um, think if you're, uh, you know, if you think that there's a, 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 you know, a global reset of the monetary system is, is a 5% probability, you probably want to have 5% of your assets in gold. Mm-hmm. Yes, I um, I also hold gold. Um, I've been trading futures, actually, um, but I also have the physical commodity. So I have a mix of that as well. And I actually, yeah, I still have the GLD ETF. I have some long calls in that. I have naked calls. Um, I have been um, purchasing as well some naked uh, long calls in those type of um, assets. Now, let's speak a little bit about equities and stocks and sectors that you are looking for to do your trading, your options trading. Um, I know biotechs are not a sector that you prefer. Is that yeah. correct? And, uh, only because I... I'm not only because I'm not very good at it. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a, it's a volatile sector. I I just wish I was better at trading biotech, but that that's one where I just don't seem to, to ever be in sync with the market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been doing some medical and uh, healthcare um, stocks, and I I'm bullish on some you know select stocks here and there. Or could you share with us any that you're looking at in particular that you are bullish on at this time or i guess forget that word bullish you see strength yeah. at this time look I, I think at the moment um well in general i i'll i'll trade any any sector um uh, I, I don't tend to trade real estate at all because it's just not volatile enough i, I don't particularly like trading utilities because it, it just tends to be a fairly low beta a fairly boring sector from a trading perspective uh consumer staples would be probably my third least favorite sector to trade again, just because it tends to be fairly low beta. I, I, I will look at it from time to time, but it's not one of my favorites. Um, you know, tech is is where all the market cap is. And, and we've had amazing opportunities to the upside and the downside from that sector. Uh, and sectors like, um, you know, banks and industrials have, have really come to life. They've become a lot more interesting. Uh, consumer discretionary is always always good. You know, the Amazons and the Teslas and the, the Netflixes of the world. Um, communications obviously was was the the real laggard last year, uh, and that's uh, that's really sprung to life this year as well. Uh, energy sector has been. I mean, that was the only sector in an uptrend all year last year. So that was uh, great to trade from the long side. Um, but honestly, I'll, I'll, I'll trade any of them so long as there's a there's a trend and an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Sounds great. Now, dividends. Are you looking at any? I know you're not much of a long term investor. Are you interested in any of the dividend stocks? Do you hold nah. any of those? No. No. Nah, Too boring. Doesn't, yeah, it's not not my wheelhouse. <laughs> Perfect. And it's about knowing thyself. So that's yeah. very important. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us. And you know, Simon, is there anything I missed that you'd like to share with us? I do want you to tell us about the Tao of Trading Academy that you offer. Um, could you tell us about that, please? Sure. So 
So, so my book, The Tower of Trading, it's it's a book on options trading, but as you said, it's it's a little unconventional. And you know, people ask me, well, why why did you write a book on options trading when there's already five hundred other books on options trading out there? It's a, it's a very fair question. Um, the reason I wrote The Tower of Trading was because most, if not all, of the books on options trading out there are both hard and boring. You know, they're, they're difficult and and they 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 read like textbooks. And I thought the world needed a book on options trading that was both simple and fun and engaging. And, and that was my mission in writing this book. And so I've built an online academy in, in that vein, teaching people how to trade options without any of the complex math, keeping keeping it really simple, really visual, really intuitive, uh, and focusing not just on setups. I mean, trading setups are really important but really focusing on things like risk management and psychology and mindset as well. There's a chapter. There are quite a few. I have to say the name of your chapters are amazing. I love peanut butter options. <laughs> and, you know, um, it's obviously about spreads because you spread peanut butter. Um, there's also a chapter, and I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't read the book, but could you just give us a little bit about it? It's um, how is trading like sex? Could you just yeah. tell us a little bit about that? Well, I mean, the, the reason I, so so that chapter really is on trading psychology, right? But I, but I knew if I called the chapter trading psychology, a lot of people would be tempted just to skip past it. They'd be like, oh, I, I don't need that. I just need to know when to buy. Uh, and this, this is a really common misconception. Uh, people who are new to trading, they just think, just just give me an entry, give me a buy signal, and that's all I need to make money. And honestly, nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> very catchy title, I have to say. That very smart you are, Simon. Could you tell us about your Tao of Trading Academy for everyone, please? Yeah, so um, we've got uh, we've got an online self paced academy. Uh, there's um, oh, there's about twenty there's a, over twenty five hours worth of content in there, split up in uh, over sixty videos. So it's all sort of in bite size bite-sized segments it's quite easily digestible uh, and we cover everything from what is an option so even if you've never heard of options trading you don't even know what an option is uh, we'll get you up to speed with the options 101 module we've got a module in technical analysis where you'll you'll learn to look at the markets the way i look at them uh, we've got three modules or well, four modules now detailing different setups three trend following setups and one counter trend setup uh, and then modules on risk management and mindset and psychology and with the flagship program options academy elevate uh, we also offer 12 monthly coaching calls and lifetime access that's uh that's the lifetime of the program not uh, not the not the members lifetime no, of course yeah. <laughs> that's great and that's the tau of trading.com that's and right we can stay in touch with you and simon re on twitter as well um Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, My you, pleasure, Rosanna. You bring so much to trading and with your mindset, risk management, your macro, you've got everything. So thank you so much. I appreciate it always. Thank you. Everyone You're very for welcome. Thank you, everyone, for listening and uh, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Rose Show Podcast. Please visit rosannaprestia.com for more episodes. See you soon.